Hello, friends. Welcome back. As I'm filming this video tonight, it's windy outside and gloomy and threatening rain. It's that awkward transition period between seasons where the calendar says it's fall, but summer is still fighting. Mother Nature is asserting herself, stirring the pot, if you will, making for a very turbulent and troubled day outside, weather-wise, and it seems appropriate somehow as we uh, take a look at the materials in front of us. Relics from um, what seems like a a lifetime ago for me, frankly. Artifacts from the days when I was in a weekly gaming group back in the mid-90s. There were some co-workers in the group and some friends from college. And the main goal of getting that particular group together was to have a consistent play group for a new game at that time that Wizards of the Coast had just released called Jihad. This uh, was a game created by Richard Garfield, who is the fellow who created Magic the Gathering. A little old uh, collector card game that you might have heard of. And then shortly after this game was released, The name was changed to Vampire the Eternal Struggle. So this was a collector card game with a vampire theme. It was based on the role-playing game Vampire the Masquerade that uh, White Wolf was publishing at the time. It came out in that uh, that time in the mid-90s, shortly after the initial success of Magic the Gathering, when other game companies were... Uh, trying to figure out how they could get um, similar format games in the market as well. The, the strike while the iron's hot uh, mentality that you see anytime a new thing gets popular for the very first time. And uh, this was one of those games. Um, and I thought it might be fun to break out some of the old cards and uh, do some soft spoken reading of the text and listen.
listening to the uh, sounds of the cards in the hand and uh, just kind of flipping through and zoning out a little bit with an old game that I used to uh, used to play. We're not going to try to learn the game today, of course. Truth be told, I don't really even remember how to play the game myself. It was a, it was a complicated game. I dare say more involved than Magic the Gathering was. More optimized for group play with some interesting mechanics that were unique to larger multiplayer card game formats. The truth is I, I had occasion to look at the rule book again a couple of years ago and it was like trying to read a foreign language. I could barely understand what I was looking at and the thought that I had at one point played that game uh, effectively every week as well as spent time keeping up on rules changes and clarification lists. It was a little bit humbling, perhaps even a little troubling that I had all but lost that ability. I guess it's a, uh, a use it or lose it kind of a situation, isn't it? I love the feel and the sound of handling cards, any kind of cards. These are, these are all vampires here. The idea in this game was that you played the role of a very powerful old vampire and you would further your agenda by influencing younger, weaker vampires to do your bidding. And these cards represent those vampires that you would try to influence to affect other players and try to gain victory points to win the game at the end. And then the other cards that you would handle are these cards. These are the various actions and reactions and equipment and combat cards. Cards called master cards. These are the ones that you would play from your hand to conduct actions during your turn.
I thought it might be nice to take a small selection of these cards and go through them slowly, read the words, and uh, see what we think of them without worrying too much about the fact that we don't remember how to play. And I picked out a small selection of cards, and I did so using a very specific criterion that really spoke to another aspect of this game and, and frankly, all trading card games that really resonated with me. And that has to do with artwork. These, these collectible card games, beginning with Magic the Gathering, really brought a lot of amazing artwork to the player's fingertips. You can see it in all of these cards we're handling right now. The fascinating thing is that the artwork is completely irrelevant in terms of playing the game, isn't it? I mean, as long as the cards have the their writing on them, the letters and the numbers and the titles, as long as you know how to use the card according to the rules of the game, you can play without the artwork, can't you? But if you've ever played a collectible card game like this, imagine, imagine how entertaining or not it would be if every card in your hand just had a blank square here where the artwork would be. You think that would be a very entertaining way to spend your time playing a game? I tend to think not. And that's the kicker about artwork in these card games, isn't it? Because even though they're not needed, their absence has no rules impact. We realize that the artwork has everything to do with setting the mood the context, the world building, and even your own enthusiasm as a player getting certain cards in your hand and playing certain cards because you just got a kick out of the artwork. So much of the texture and the tone and the mood of the world that the game is set in is communicated solely through the artwork. Just in this pile of cards that we're flipping through, you can see a ton of different artistic styles because they used a great many different artists in these games. And so as you might imagine, if you were a fan of the art in these games at all, you might develop some personal 
favorites. Favorite cards because of the artwork, or perhaps even favorite artists. I think most people had some favorites that they enjoyed, and I was no exception. So what I thought we would do today is look through a small collection of cards. They are the cards that I have here. And these cards I pulled from the bigger collection because these cards feature the artwork of who became my favorite card game artist from this era. An artist by the name of Drew Tucker. These cards all have artwork from the watercolor artist Drew Tucker. And his work was my favorite from back in the day and I still enjoy it very much. Now, the notable thing here is that Drew was a somewhat polarizing artist because his work, well, it had its fans and frankly it had its detractors because many times he favored a very abstract watercolor style and not everybody was a fan of that sort of thing. But I thought it was amazing. And so, why don't I take you on a short tour of Drew Tucker's work for this card game by taking a hopefully relaxing look at cards that bear his work. The first section of cards in this stack are the vampires and then we'll as we get farther down into the stack we'll get into the non uh, vampire cards and as we look at these not only will we consider the artwork but we'll look at some of the little symbols and I'll speak briefly about what they mean So first up, we have a vampire named Brazil. All of these vampires have a number down here in the corner that represents their age. And I've got these ranked from youngest to oldest. And the idea is that the younger the vampire is, the more easily influenced they are 
by you, the, the powerful vampire. But, of course, since they're younger and weaker, they don't have as many skills or special abilities, and uh, they don't last as long. But this is Brazil. This is his clan symbol, and this indicates that he is a Malkavian. Malkavians were the uh, insane uh, clan of vampires. This is a two. This means that he's fairly young. And this little symbol here is a, uh, a special ability called Auspex. And then we have Drew Tucker's painting. You're going to see a lot of uh, recurring themes here. Again, his he tended toward abstract work with his watercolors. The, the inherent variability of watercolor and how watercolors bleed together at borders and things like that lends to a very lends to a final image that leaves leaves things to the imagination shall we shall we say i always responded to that very well it's not a his style is not a very crisp, literal style. There's lots of room for interpretation and suggestion in his work. So we'll, we'll see that theme repeated throughout. So given that, we'll try to, we'll try to go through some of these cards. But this is Brazil, the young Malkavian Brazil. The face in shadow, the arm in shadow. I think he's got red eyes that appear to light from within. Spooky fellow. This is Joseph. He belongs to a corrupted version of a clan of visually disfigured uh, vampires called the Nosferatu. This, this red symbol underneath the mask means that he belongs to a, a version of the Nosferatu clan that has been corrupted by blood magic. That's what this Sabbat uh, title also means. This card comes from the Sabbat set. That's what the little S means. And this vampire has the abilities of obfuscate, which is the little black square, animalism, which is the little paw print, and obtenebration, which is the little symbol there that indicates uh, magical control of shadows. It's a rather determined, somehow determined look on Joseph's face. I like the... Uh, the way the red blood on the cheeks is also brought down into the colors in the upper torso here. It's, it's hard to tell in some ways whether Joseph even has all of his skin. But again, Nosferatu are supposed to be 
visually challenging to look at, so maybe that fits. This is Victoria, also Malkavian, age five, with the abilities of obfuscate. Celerity, which is the little lightning bolt symbol there, and auspex. And because the auspex is in a diamond shape instead of a square, that means she has superior aspects. If Victoria is ready during your master phase, you may forfeit the edge to gain two pool. Victoria is from the Dark Sovereigns set, which is what that little stained glass symbol means. I like the awkwardly vacant look on Victoria's face that Mr. Tucker has gone for here. You can't tell if that's a very determined look or a borderline confused look. This is Ian Forrestal. Ian Forrestal is from the corrupted Tremere clan, and it's a Sabbat card. Ian Forrestal is a is a level eight vampire, so this is a more this is an older and more powerful vampire. Ian Forrestal has superior aspects and dominate and thaumaturgy. Superior in all of those. And the card reads, Sabbat. Ian can play cards of any discipline as though he has the basic level of that discipline. Master discipline cards played on him grant the superior level of that discipline. I love the very dark red palette that Tucker has used from, from wall to wall on this painting, shrouded in the shadows. This is Virgil. Virgil is from the corrupted Malkavian clan. He's also a level eight. He's a Sabbat bishop. As a directed action, Virgil may gain control of a retainer. Put that retainer on him. As a plus one stealth action, he may burn a retainer he controls to gain an amount of blood equal to that retainer's life from the blood bank. A very smug look on Virgil's face. This painting almost makes me think of a uh, some sort of a hired thug in a way. Maybe a hired thug who's been at it for a very long time. Virgil. Now here is Lucian. And Lucian is perhaps my favorite. My favorite uh, Drew Tucker vampire, but also perhaps my my favorite vampire in the game. Also a Malkavian. You'll notice Drew Tucker didn't do paintings for a lot of the uh, 
prettier or uh, well-to-do vampire clans. He did the Nosferatu and, and Malkavians, which I think is an interesting, uh, perhaps fitting choice given his style. I'm not sure. I'm sure he did other, other clans, I just don't happen to have them. But you can see Lucian is a 10 here. He's the Malkavian Justicar. Lucian can steal equipment as a strike. The cool thing about Lucian is that in the in the lore, in the in the role-playing game, Lucian is thought to be one of the few third generation vampires still in existence. And when we talk about generations in Vampire the Masquerade, we're talking about generations down from Cain, as in the Cain from Cain and Abel. In this game, Cain is thought to be the progenitor of all the vampires, and the vampires that Cain sired himself would be second generation, and then the vampires that that generation sired would be third generation. And Lucian here is one of the few surviving third generation vampires. And that's that's good to know because there's something ancient about this face, I feel. Something about the wrinkles and the, the, the furrow of the brow. Something about this face tells me that he's been, he's been playing the game a long time. He's been for him to stay alive as long as he has. He's had to be very good at manipulation and survival. Very good at pulling strings behind the scenes. And all of those choices and all of those decisions appear on his face after all these years. This is Lucian. This is the last Drew Tucker vampire that I have. This is Leandro, also a Malkavian. He's even older than Lucian. He's an 11. Also from the Dark Sovereign set. And his text reads, Inner Circle, Four Votes. If Leandro is ready during any Methuselah's untap phase, except yours, that Methuselah burns one pool or loses all transfers during his or her next influence phase, plus two bleed. The use of the word Methuselah there refers to us, the players, the the, the powerful behind-the-scenes vampires that we're supposed to be are called Methuselahs. Every time I've considered Drew Tucker's work on this card, for some reason, I, there's a I get an ancient Roman vibe from. Leandro's face somehow. Like the lack of detail, but the swooping lines of the architecture of the face. Swooping lines of hair, swooping cheekbone. Seems like he would be in a robe on some 
Roman veranda around the time of uh, Pompeii somehow. That's the the vibe I've always got from Leandro. So now we get into the non vampire cards. This is an ally card. And it's uh it's for the clan of vampires called the Giovanni, which is what this little script G means. This is Leonardo Mortician. Unique ally with two life. One hand damage, zero bleed. Leonardo may take a plus one stealth action to move one blood from the blood bank to any ready vampire. Unnoticed in the house of Hades, two you'll wander flittering after faded corpses. Sappho. I like the way Tucker has positioned Leonardo's hands in this painting as if as if he's getting ready to set about work that he takes a lot of personal pleasure in. I also like the the implication of a shadow along this wall here. perhaps even a little more detail than usual for Tucker in this painting. Tainted Vitae. This is a reaction card from the Ancient hearts set. That's what this little Egyptian eye means. Only usable when a vampire controlled by your predator successfully hunts. That vampire gains two additional blood. Ignore excess blood. For the remainder of the game, that vampire must burn an additional blood when he or she attempts to bleed you. I like the, the chalice form, but perhaps the most evocative thing that Tucker does here is, is the contorted shape that is implied in these hands, as if as if the Vitae has just been consumed and, as the title implies, it is tainted and is causing some problems for the consumer. Inverary, Scotland. This is an equipment card. This equipment card represents a unique location. The cost for this location is paid by a vampire. Put this card on that vampire. The vampire with this location may move one blood to this card as a minion phase action. No more than three blood may be put on this card the vampire gets plus X bleed, where X is the amount of blood on the card. This is a fairly straightforward painting with uh, more detail than usual for Tucker, although he is able to go somewhat abstract with all of this forest detail in the foreground.
Ritual of the Bitter Rose All your ready vampires gain the amount of blood from the blood bank that is on a vampire you are destroying by diablery. Usable in combat if an enemy is burned. Blood hunt may only be called on the vampire who committed the diablery. There's a really vibrant color palette in this piece. The foreground and the colors in the stem of this chalice really pop out as do parts of the figure here. This is Crusade Houston. This is a political action card. Political card worth one vote called by any Sabbath vampire at plus one stealth. Successful vote means the acting vampire is declared Archbishop of Houston. This could lead to a contested title. Tucker is clearly uh, communicating a, an unsavory tactic in this painting, perhaps to suggest that Uh, this particular vampire's path to becoming Archbishop, Archbishop of Houston was perhaps not completely on the up and up. Forgotten Labyrinth Normal Obfuscate, this is a plus two stealth card, only usable during a non-bleeding action. At Superior Obfuscate, it's a plus three stealth, only usable during a non-bleeding action. I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinth ways. Francis Thompson, the Hound of Heaven. I'm a big fan of the very neutral uh, palette in this painting. A lot of whites, grays, and blacks, and not much in between. I really like that look. Clan loyalty. Only usable when a vampire you control is blocked by a vampire of the same clan. The action is not blocked and no other vampires of that clan may block the acting vampire until the end of the turn. Clearly a group setting here, a, a setting of group coercion, perhaps, with a primary instigator getting a subject to do exactly what he and the rest of the clan want.
lost in crowds. A plus one stealth card at normal, obfuscate. Plus two stealth at superior, obfuscate. I like the, uh, I like the way that the crowd is depicted here. The just kind of general noise of detail here where the crowd becomes rather indistinct from each other that would be very easy to get lost in. Drew Tucker painted a uh, Magic the Gathering card called Lost, no, I'm sorry, Angry Mob that has kind of a similar vibe with the crowd of people here. If you want to Google that uh, artwork. Lost in Crowds. Cauldron of Blood. This is a combat card that uses uh, Thaumaturgy, which is the, the discipline related to blood magic. At regular Thaumaturgy, this is a strike three damage, not usable first round. At superior, strike five damage, not usable first round. This is intentionally uh, indistinct, but really well suited to Drew's watercolor style. This notion of a cauldron, the round edge here, and then the splotchiness within. It reminds me a little bit of uh, a magic card called Chaos Moon that Tucker also painted some similar aspects. Obviously a very uniform uh, palette with this dark area intersecting through here. And this is a master card, and the rest of the cards that we're going to look at uh, today are all master cards. Master cards are cards that you would play perhaps once per turn, and they have over overreaching effects over over the entire game. Kind of context setting kind of cards. This is called Blood Puppy. It's a unique master. Put three blood from the blood bank on the blood puppy. During your untap phase, you can take a blood from the puppy to your blood pool, add a blood to the puppy from the blood bank, or burn the puppy and get all its blood. Any other Methuselah's minion can burn the puppy as a directed action, which will cause all its blood to be lost. I always got a sense of desperation somehow from the scene on this card. Perhaps a vampire's last, last resort somehow in staying alive. This is Bureaucratic Overload, another unique master. Put this card in play. Any minion attempting a political action burns one additional blood. This card may be burned by a successful vote. Calling that vote is a plus one stealth action. 
create constancy of purpose toward improvement of products and services with the aim to become competitive. Dr. Deming, 14 points for the transformation of management. I really like this work. Uh, you think about bureaucratic overload. Many of us probably work in jobs where we feel that there's a little too much red tape. There's a little too much process to try to get through, to try to get a job done. And uh, this picture sums that up perfectly for me. This room is too crowded. How much of a process is getting slowed down because there's too many people overloading this space. I know that resonates with my work situation very much and perhaps yours as well. Can you hear the rain? Good night, sweet prince. MasterCard. Only usable if you have at least one untapped Ravnos in play. Tap one of your Ravnos. Move the next vampire in the crypt of any Methuselah to that Methuselah's ash heap. If the vampire you place in the ash heap is a prince, gain two pool. Ravnos was one of the clans introduced in the Dark Sovereigns set. A fairly high level of abstraction in this one. You can see there's perhaps some protagonists here along the edge and some sort of a focus of their attentions here. One would assume that this is the, uh, the metaphor for the vampire that's going to get sent to the ash heap. Nosferatu Hosting MasterCard You may use a master phase action to look at one vampire in another Methuselah's inactive region. This card may be burned by any minion who is not Toreador as a directed action. Toreador is one of the other vampire clans. I'm really fond of the faces here. I'm really fond of the, the the appearance that some of these background faces might actually have a little more detail than this foreground face. Nosferatu hosting. Smiling Jack the Anarch. Unique MasterCard. Put one blood from your blood pool on Jack during your untap phase. Each other Methuselah during his or her untap phase must lose one pool or one blood from a vampire he or she controls for each blood on Jack. Any vampire can burn Jack as a directed action. This is one of my favorite Tucker uh, paintings, and this to me has a very classic Dracula look about it, a very Bela Lugosi, um, you know, black and white movie kind of a pose, right? The, the victim here, 
a very traditional vampire approach from from behind and down to the side like this. This just looks very Bella Lugosi Dracula to me. It's great. I love it. Anachronism from the Ancient Hearts set. Master, put this card on a vampire with capacity above six. Any ranged weapons possessed by this vampire, except the ivory bow, are burned. It's a very subdued palette here. I like the greens right here in this apparent door frame, perhaps. Looks like a turban. Looks like he's dressed from a from a desert kind of a climate. This uh, expansion had a clan in it called the Followers of Set, which I believe fit this description. The children of Osiris, Master, put this card in play. Followers of Set do not untap as normal. Each follower of Set may burn one blood to untap during each of his or her controller's untap phases. This card may be burned by any vampire as a directed action. Followers of Set get minus one stealth when attempting that action. This is a much more detailed uh, painting from Tucker. The detail in the blades in particular gives the whole uh, painting a, a linear geometry or perhaps a directional geometry that brings the eye from right to left that is not typical of his work. The Damned, Unique Master. Put this card on a vampire with a capacity below five. The vampire with this card burns one additional blood for each bleeding action he or she successfully performs. The beast I am, lest the beast I become. So, clearly, the idea here is that this vampire has to work even a little extra hard. It's a little more taxing to do what needs to be done, and that weighs, that weighs on a vampire. The Kabar Community Unique Master Put this card in play. Each Asamite gets plus one stealth when bleeding. This card may be burned by any minion as a directed action. Tremere get plus one stealth when attempting that action. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. The friend of my enemy is my enemy. I really like the subdued red palette that Tucker uses in the background of this image. And I like the gesture of the shaking hand here as if to indicate a, an unsteady and probably temporary alliance.
the path of blood. Unique Master. Put this card in play. Asamites burn one less blood when playing cards that require quietus. This card may be burned by any minion as a directed action. If that minion is a vampire, he or she then takes one damage. Damage not preventable when this card is burned. Generally, I like this imagery, although I have to confess that the, the multitude of human forms in the background here um, unfortunately suggests to me really bad wallpaper. Communal Haven, Temple, Master, Location. Each Sabbat vampire you control gets plus one intercept when attempting to block directed actions directed against Sabbat vampires you control. A player may have only one Communal Haven in play. No sooner is a temple built to God, but the devil builds a chapel hard by. George Herbert I like the foreground candles. I, li I like the fact that there's generally no foreground point of interest in this painting. It's like we're glimpsing in on just something happening in the background with no obvious focal point to draw our attention. And this is the last Drew Tucker card I have for us to look at today, and it's called Short-Term Investment. Master, move three blood from the blood bank to this card. You may use a master phase action to move one blood from this card to your blood pool. Burn this card when the last blood counter on it is removed. So it's a way to store a short-term supply of blood that then keeps, that you're able to draw from, from a, for a certain number of turns. The interesting thing about this card is that uh, there was a card, I believe, of the exact same name uh, in the game Netrunner, which Richard Garfield also created, and it did a very similar thing, only with uh, something called bits, which was the currency in that game. Again, I'm a big fan of how the only uh, the only parts of this painting that have any real color value is the red. Everything else is very neutral. And I like the foreground chain here. A few in the background, but I like this draping right through in the foreground. It's very uh, arresting. And there we have it. A collection of Drew Tucker's artwork as used on a card game that I used to know a great deal about years and years ago in another life. It's always interesting to 
crack open the book of, of our lives to a chapter from long ago and to flip through the pages and to see how familiar or unfamiliar, how nostalgic or perhaps unpleasant sometimes those little glimpses back can be. I have a lot of fond memories of those days. Priorities change, as they often do, and the gaming group eventually fell apart and we went our separate ways, but I still love games, not only solo games that I might play on my phone, but tabletop games that I play with the family. One of the co-workers that was in this gaming group still works at the same place I do, and I see him in the hallways every now and again. I just saw him yesterday, as a matter of fact, and every time I see him, I think about these vampires and these, these complex rules and those late, long games that we used to have. And I enjoy being reminded of all of these previous chapters that I have. And I enjoy opening up those chapters every now and again and peeking inside and being reminded of what it was like back then and catching a glimpse, a memory of the person I used to be back in those days. Memories like that and games like this, things I used to do or like little signposts, little mile markers. You remember a game that you used to play, and you remember everything else that happened around that time of your life, right? You remember the place you lived. You remember all the people you used to that, that were part of your life back then. You know, I wasn't married then. I didn't have kids. It was a very different chapter. The chapters have a tendency of bleeding from one to the other gradually, not slamming shut abruptly. Sometimes you don't know that the, that the chapter has moved on unless you look back and then you're taken by surprise at how much has actually changed. Looking back at this game is, is a little like that for me. We all have chapters we'd rather not look back on, I suppose, but hopefully we also all have some that, that we do. And we should take a few minutes every once in a while to do that nothing wrong with reviewing the path traveled so far as we take a breather on our uh, forward trip down the path that we're on now. I hope you guys have enjoyed this little nostalgic look back at Vampire the Eternal Struggle, and my favorite collector card game artist, Drew Tucker. It's now raining pretty hard outside, which seems perfectly fitting and a great note to close on. Take care of yourselves and the people around you. 
Thanks so much for being with me again. And I hope to see you again very soon. Bye-bye.